وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين المنتجبين لا سيما مولانا وسيدي صاحب الأسر والزمان روحي وأرواه العالمين له الفداء وأجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف ولانة دائمة على أعدائهم ومنكر فذائلهم إلى الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بار رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي For the hastening of the return of our 12th Imam Imam Al-Hujjah one salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. This evening I want to uh, begin a series of discussions, a series of sessions on a particular topic that I've been meaning to speak about um, literally for the last year, but obviously other things have come up. And so I found this to be an ideal opportunity to at least begin the session tonight and then continue on within, uh, within the upcoming programs, at least for the next maybe one or, or two or three more sessions at least. Um, until we get to the final conclusion of the overall theme. So tonight's is going to be more of a theoretical approach to the topic um, as it's on the screen, uh, so happy together. The rubrics and the reflections on gender integration versus segregation in Islam. It's a topic that I have never spoken about, but it is a topic which obviously is of importance for us as a community. Uh, it and impacts many aspects of our lives, both in the private realm when we're on our own outside of the religious centers, and obviously when it comes to religious events and gatherings and generally community events on a whole. And so I wanted to take this opportunity tonight to at least introduce the topic, um, to understand some of the terminologies which are uh, a part of this discussion and see how our scholars define where we draw the line or what is the understanding that we have in Islam between gender integration and or segregation. Before I go to the actual rulings, let me just give us a brief introduction or a preamble to this discussion. When we look at the relig religion of Islam and the regulations that we all are obliged to follow, especially in relation to male-female interaction, we realize that as human beings, first and foremost, even outside of the realm of Islam, that these regulations which have been in there since the time of literally Adam and Eve, and have obviously been developed as society grew and matured and nurtured themselves and were propagating and becoming more and more of a larger community, that regulations and rules had to be implemented by Allah, by God, to deal with this level of interaction. And really this rule, these rules that we have really relate to human civilization and the survival of the human species. Obviously, in order to understand this, I don't have all the time tonight, but we need to really understand Islam as a holistic religion. Holistic meaning that it, can, it, it, it works for every aspect of our life. Islam looks at the human life and existence as one entity, Right? We have different aspects of our life. We have our careers, our studies, we have entertainment, we have you know, all of the areas of our life. Islam comes to regulate the holistic look of the human being that takes all of these matters into consideration. And then rather than addressing only one aspect of the human life, Islam looks at it as one um, you know, giant picture that we have to look at and understand. It's similar to a picture on the wall. We have, I mean, many pictures on the wall around us. If you were to go very close to the picture and only be able to see maybe a one inch by one inch picture, a portion of the picture on the wall, you would only see that portion of what you could see. But if you step back one or two feet, then you look at the picture and you see the entire what is written on that, pic on that frame. So Islam is looking at our lives in that holistic way that we can't just necessarily zoom into one aspect of our life. Rather, we have to take that step back and understand the entire concept of life, why we're on earth, why God put us here, what the regulations are. And when we understand that entire holistic 
reason of our existence, then the rulings of Islam, the ahkam that we follow from our marja, they'll make a bit more sense because then we understand that they're looking at our existence not just as a person living, but in the entire scope of our existence on this earth. We understand that Islam is not just the true religion. It's not just how to pray, how to fast, how to go to hajj. These are aspects of the religion, but it's also a social order. Right? And even when you study the history of Islam, the Prophet, when he came to bring Islam to the people of Mecca, the Quraysh, they had no problem with him as a prophet of God teaching people how to pray, how to worship God, how to go to the bathroom, these mundane activities. Their problem with the prophet in Islam was on a social order. How was Islam revolutionizing the social pattern of the human being at that time? And so Islam as not just a religion but a social order, it wants us to attain happiness in life, be happy, right? Enjoy the world of this, the life of this world. There's nothing wrong with enjoying life. But Islam says that it's not only the social order of the life of the world, but it's training us, it's giving us what we need for the world to come. For what we don't realize what we need. Just as the child in the womb of his or her mother, he would look at this umbilical cord. What's the need of this cord? Why can't I just live without it? Why am I stuck with this cord in my mother's womb? Right? He doesn't realize that that is the way to gain existence and grow and, and nurture in his mother's womb or her mother's womb until the time of delivery. And that that would be the means or that would be the way that he or she would grow to come into this world. Similarly, Islam is looking at it in the same way that the social order and the rules that Islam brings are not just for this world, Yes, they are there to, you know, to safeguard our needs and requirements now, but more so in the world to come. And so what we understand at one level is that Islam wants to actually remove any possible causes which may cause us harm, either direct harm to the individual or society. Islam is looking at the issue from a holistic point of view by addressing the root cause Right. In our life, we understand root cause. When you work for companies, sometimes a problem happens, and you'll go back and they'll say, go do a root cause analysis. Why did that software fail? Why did that piece of hardware fail? It failed, fine. The software broke, okay, but what is the root cause of that? Right. You can patch the software, but you want to go know why that happened. Was there user error? Was there some input that was invalid? Right. We have to analyze many issues in Islam, if not all of them, from that aspect. Get to the root cause, what is causing the problem, and then fix that. Don't just, you know, somebody who has a cough, and they take a cough suppressant, they're not addressing why the cough began in the first place. They might have bronchitis, they may have something more severe. You might take the cough su suppressant and, and cool the cough for a few hours, but you won't get to the root cause. And so Islam says, go to the root to address happiness, prosperity, success of this world and the world to come. And in this discussion for tonight, we also obviously want to look at this issue and see in terms of gender relations, why does Islam or where does Islam stand, first of all, on the, on, on the, on the rubric of integration or separation between the genders? Generally speaking, as we see, Islam discourages, it doesn't prohibit, it discourages, and we'll explain what we mean by that. Free and unbridled contact between men and women in order to deal with possible inclinations. I mean, we have to face the facts as men and women, we all have inclinations and de desires towards the opposite gender. This is something not shunned in Islam, this is something that God put within our psyche, within our being. And somebody who doesn't have those inclinations, obviously there's a different topic for them. But Islam has put that within the human being. The shahwa is something that we are built with, that we are ingrained in the human psyche with. And so we see that if there were no you know, restraints, if it was left open, then as we mentioned that this could lead to massive repercussions in the world today. Now I don't want to seem melodramatic <coughs> and trying to 
paint a picture of, you know, complete annihilation of humanity. But there are many issues which can stem if these issues are not tackled at the root. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And so we'll see that Islam brings rules in place. And as we've talked about in the past, the rules of Islam, the ahkam, are not to limit us. Right? I mentioned this before and I'll, I'll say it again that Islamic rules do not limit our freedoms. In actuality, they actually broaden our freedoms. They give us a better understanding of how we can live. And the example I've given in the past is people who live in non-Muslim societies as we do here today. The marajas say that when you live in a non-Muslim society, when you meet a non-Muslim, or sorry, when you meet another human being, you have to presume that they are Muslims. By default, we are obliged to presume everybody is a Muslim until we know other than that. This clears up a lot of issues in terms of interaction with people. You shake their hand, is that a Hindu, is it is this, is it a that? You don't have to presume that they are one or the other. You just presume they're a Muslim. This is not my ruling, this is Ayatollah Sistani's ruling, and many other maraja, if not all of them. So by knowing the rule, it doesn't limit you, it actually gives you more freedom in what to do. Music is another category. When people say all music is haram, that goes against what the maraja say, which is obviously based on hadith. But if I was to say all music is haram, I'm limiting myself and others. But if I study the rules and the, I see that the marajas say this form is allowed, this is not allowed, these are the limits, then you open up avenues of permissibility of what you can listen to. You're not stuck by just walking around with earplugs in your ears all day. These rulings, again, help us to better live our lives as believers. So we come to a challenge where, where do we as Muslims stand? We have two avenues we can take. We can be reactive, in meaning that when something happens, we react to it and we try to put out the fire. Or we can be proactive. We can look at the situation from the holistic point of view. We can find out the rulings of the scholars on any issue, tonight just on gender issues that we want to cover. And then we can determine where do we stand? What can we do? What area, what road, route should we take in life? So either we can be reactive, which many times, unfortunately, our communities tend to do that. We are reacting to situations. Something happens in the media, we react. Something happens to our youth, we react to it. Something happens to one of us, we react. But we can also be proactive. We can say, well, look, these are issues in our communities. And we will talk about that in our, in our next session. These are the problems that our community is facing. What are the answers from Islam to bring about a, res a resolution to the problems that we are facing in North America as Muslims? So tonight for session one, I just want to look again at the topic of gender integration or gender segregation. Where does Islam draw the line? What are the rules of Islam? Where does Islam say that you have to follow X, Y, and Z? Where are there legal loopholes, so to speak? Because Islam gives us very you know, open loopholes to follow. I mean, loopholes is maybe a bad word to use, but we literally have ways within our religion to better perform our actions. And this goes for many of the rulings that we have. It's not just tax, rule, you know, not just tax rules that have loopholes in our system. Even Islam has a system where you can actually legally circumvent the law and there's no prohibitions with it. Let me first define what a mixed gender gathering is so we can get a better picture of the different scenarios I want to go over. So the general definition given by our scholars of a mixed gender gathering is a gathering of men and women, Muslim or not, it doesn't make a difference, but they're all observing the required Islamic hijab, both a physical hijab and the mental hijab, and they are in a gathering without a physical partition and or without a designated area for either gender. So this is what we de would determine as a mixed gathering. Obviously mixed gatherings in which people are not dressed appropriately, that is obviously, it goes without saying, those are forbidden. 
Those are not even a part of this discussion. Because we know in those, in those areas, it's forbidden to be there. Now that doesn't mean you don't go to work and work with females or males. It doesn't mean that you can't go to school. It doesn't mean you can't go shopping. These are obviously outside of our level of control. This is the society we live in. Not only here, but you go to the Muslim countries as well. And all of us in societies, we have these you know, common areas, common space, the parks, all of these things. So we can't control certain environments. What we can't control, we can't control. So you can't say, well, we go to the mall and we're mixed, so we come to the mosque and mix as well. No, those are unique circumstances. And the religious centers or religious events are unique circumstances as well. One thing to keep in mind is that mixing of the genders is not impermissible. Meaning that it is permissible to have gatherings which are mixed. But what is impermissible is mixing in which there is a possibility of immorality taking place in actions which are impermissible taking place. So having a mixed gathering, again, mixed men and women together is not impermissible. The definition of it obviously is, is that if there is a possibility of that mixing leading to something immoral, this is where Islam comes and again draws the line, not because it doesn't want us to enjoy life, not because God wants to put all these hurdles in our way, but because again, as I mentioned in the beginning, Islam is a holistic religion, looking at every aspect of our life in this world and the world to come, it requires rules to ensure that we don't actually have to go for a cure for a problem in society, but rather that we actually prevent rather than having to cure. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So there are six areas that I want to very briefly look at tonight of where the rulings apply and how are they understood and what is the obligation for us as believers. We have normal religious events, the waladats, shahadats, birth and death anniversaries, what we have even tonight. We have educational lectures that also come under this gambit of the mixed gatherings. We have the madrasa classroom setting, both in the madrasa, the Sunday school, and also in the public school system, we could say, or if we ever have a full-time Muslim school, that these rules would apply to that. We have seminars and workshops. We have conferences, committee meetings. And then obviously we have marriage receptions. And obviously that can be you know, even further elaborated upon but in, in different areas. But we've just chosen these six to look at for tonight. And obviously all of the rulings I'm taking for tonight will be from His Eminence Ayatollah Sistani because his rulings are clear on this issue. He has been directly asked questions about these gatherings in the Western context, in the context of Muslims living in the West. And we may disagree with his rulings. That's fair and well. Next week we have a Q&A session. If you have any questions about this issue, please email them to the, myself directly or write them and keep them with the Jamaat. And we will answer them or to the best of our ability next week. But we will take from his rulings on this particular issue. The first area are normal religious events. What we generally have every Thursday in our community, month of Muharram, Ramadan, you know, the birth anniversaries, the death anniversaries of the Imams, of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim was salam. Normally these sorts of gatherings are a monologue. The speaker talks and the audience snores. Or maybe they listen. In today's, I guess everybody's listening. Nobody's snoring. So that's good. So I'm talking and people are hopefully listening. In most cases, unless, you know, I change things up, there's very little interaction. You know, sometimes I'll ask a question and the young boys over there will, will jump up with an answer as he's wanting to do right now. Um, sometimes there's interaction in our gatherings. But in most cases, it's just a monologue, unfortunately. And, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. This is what we've had as a tradition for 14 centuries. And maybe it will change with the passing of time and with, you know, newer people coming on the, on, on, on the, on the podium and speaking and, 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 and enlightening the community. In most cases, these sorts of gatherings are serving one general purpose. Well, hopefully they are. I don't think they are. I think there's a lot to be desired in these traditional gatherings that we have to change. And I've 
talked about in the, in the, in the past that we need to change up a lot of things. But right now, they f serve a particular purpose in our community. In such gatherings, we're told that a partition needs to be, a separation rather, needs to be maintained. Now, does it have to be this nine foot wall to my left? Probably not. This is our understanding of a partition. Other communities don't do it like this. You go to some communities, it's open with maybe a five or ten foot gap. Other communities do things in different ways. Are they wrong? Obviously not. Are we wrong? Obviously not. But there is somewhere where there can be, obviously, dialogue and discussion and see how things can be changed, keeping in mind that this center was built over 30 years ago. And many of our centers in Canada, at least in the Hoja community, 30, 40 years. So things have changed. Our mentality on the outlook of the world has changed. Religious rulings are evolving. Maybe this will change in, in, in one day. And maybe, maybe it won't, right? But definitely the leaders and the youth of the community, they will be the ones to probably trumpet that change and to bring it forth. If it's permissible, it will happen. If it's not, obviously it will stay there in some shape or form. But with that said, let me, do, let me, let me mention that there are benefits of the separation. Women, for example, the sisters over there, they're free to remove their hijab. Right? If the wall is there, they can take their hijab off. It's not wajib for them to sit with a scarf on their head or an abaya or a chador for the entire program. If there's only women, no men there, if they want to be a bit relaxed, they're free to do it. If the wall wasn't there, obviously they would meet, need to maintain that hijab for the entire program. If they want to wear makeup, it's a wala that they want to dress up and look nice, wear jewelry, wear makeup, no problem. But if there's separation, then they can do that. If there's men in the same hall, that becomes a problem from the legal perspective. And so when the, a, a, a partition is there, that gives women the freedom to do what they want. They can come and go, they can remove their hijab. If a woman is, let's say, feeding her baby, she can do that with no men there looking at her. So there are some, some benefits to having a physical wall or barrier within our religious centers. Number two are educational lectures. If you came here last Friday night by the ladies' committee program that they organized, we had an educational lecture. We had men on the one side, we had ladies in the, on the other side. There was no physical wall between them here. Because in such programs, there should be equal access to the speakers, to the speaker. And so if there's a Q&A session, a discussion that ensues between the participants, you can see one another and hear one another clearly. Today, if we were to have a discussion with the ladies on that side, we'd have to pass notes back and forth or give them a mic. But on educational sessions where there is interaction between the genders, if everybody's maintaining their religious decorum, the clothing, then those programs are fully well within the limits of Islamic rules. There's nothing forbidden about it. And this is again from Ayatollah Sistani. It's not from, you know, out of my own pocket. These are his statements on where we're allowed to have such gatherings between the genders. Another example we have are the madrasa or the classroom setting. Obviously, when you're in a class, you realize the teacher has to see all of the students. The students will be interacting with one another. They'll you know, be sharing ideas, asking questions. You know, there's always interaction in the classroom. There we see that a partition would actually hinder the progress of the class. Ideally, we should have, mixed, uh, we should have separate classes, but because of perhaps a lack of room, maybe not enough teachers, maybe other factors, we find that we have to have classes which are mixed. As long as they are sitting separately, not you know, touching one another on the, uh, you know, you know, desk to desk, there's no problem in that area. But you will realize, if you do some research, that there has been a lot of studies done in North America about schools, public schools, which are either, uh, which are gender-based. So certain schools were only boys' schools, only girls' schools. And there, you know, there's no conclusive evidence on what is better. Some have shown that the students who are in, uh, in you know, single-gender schools, they do better academically. Sometimes you'll see that the girls get higher marks in those schools because now they're not trying to show up to the boys, they're not competing with the boys, they're not you know, involved at that level, they're there for the academic reason. And sometimes the boys also are more focused. 
So there are pros and cons to both of those. Again, there's research, you can read it out there, that have been done by professionals in the field of education. But for those who are madrasa teachers, you'll know that certain times when you have a student in a, uh, students in a class and it's mixed, you will see that sometimes if there's boys and girls together, that it's more difficult to control. And direct examples actually, you know, um, it's anecdotal evidence, but we've seen that when you separate the genders in madrasa, that there is a difference in the attitude of the genders, in their, you know, receptible, in, in their, in their receptive and, and accepting of what is being taught, and they're maintaining, you know, um, a bit of, of a control within the class. But here, these are uh, an, an example where it is allowed to have that mixture. Another one is seminars and workshops. Again, the purpose <coughs> is to involve the interaction between the moderator and participants and also the participants with one another. As long as all the rules again are met, Islam has no problem with that. There's no need for all of the elaborate you know, physical partitions and all of these things. The marajas say this is permissible. You can have a gathering in that format. And last, or before the end, the, last, the second last one are conferences, committee meetings. You know, we have all of these that happen so many times. We have conferences within our Muslim communities. We have meetings that we attend within our religious institutions. Again, if the moderator or the, the group is in such that, you know, there is dialogue and discussion happening back and forth, those are areas and opportunities where there is no need for that separate separation of the genders. And last but not least, and I'll just go through this really quickly, are wedding receptions, dinners. Obviously these have a different ruling, and they have to have a different ruling because of the sheer uh, rationale behind the event. You know, in these events, guests actually look forward to dressing up or as I put it, dressing down for the event. People want to look their best. Genders wear as little clothing as possible, which, what they can wear in public, to look nice, to show off their body, to show off their makeup, their jewelry. That's the whole purpose of these wedding celebrations. You don't come in a black chador and abaya with your head covered and sit there in a corner. No, it's for, a, it's for celebrating for a wedding. And Islam says, enjoy the wedding, have the walima, have a reception but have it within the limits of the religion. So when we look at weddings, obviously these are traditionally you know, completely mixed sessions. Unless people make it a point to have separate halls and separate areas where there will be no mixing of the genders, men and women we know who are non-mahram, who are not related to one another, who I can marry or whom you could marry legally, so them sitting at the same table, free mixing, where there's no hijab, where there's no covering, their makeup is being worn, where men are dressed up, as again is expected when we have these sorts of programs, these events in that way would obviously go against the norms of Islam. To have a wedding party with the genders interacting and mixing in that format for that particular style of event would not be in line with the Islamic teachings. And even that customary, you know, we put at the bottom of the wedding card, Islamic dress code is mandatory. But really, I mean, how many people would actually follow that to the letter? You know, makeup is, you know, as the marajas say, for a woman to wear makeup in front of men is haram, it's forbidden for her. For a woman to put henna on her hand and for men to see that is forbidden. Th these are clear from all of the marajas. There's no exceptions to the rule. You'll say, well, maybe they're wrong. Well, maybe they are. But right now, these are the rulings that we have based upon the scholars that we follow. And so, as the scholars say that bad hijab is as bad as no hijab. So, a bit of hair showing, people say, oh, it's only a few strands of hair. What's the big deal? Well, it's only a sip of whiskey. It's not the whole bottle I'm drinking, right? What's the big deal? It's only a half a sip of beer. I didn't drink the whole 24-pack. Right? So, a little bit of a sin is a big sin. We can't say, well, it's a little tiny sin. I, I just have a few hairs showing. I just have a bit of this and that of my body showing. I'm not, you know, on the beach wearing like that kind of clothing. No, a little bit of bad hijab is, as the scholars say, is just like having no hijab at all. A little bit of a sin is just like committing the big sin. And so obviously in that area, 
there has to be a physical partition. If people are going to be dressed up, again, as they should, then there needs to be that separation of the genders. I'll end with this because people bring up this all the time. Well, in Hajj, we're all together, right? I mean, we wear the ihram. For the men, sometimes half your body is showing, your arm is showing, and maybe your ihram falls off the top part, so your chest is showing. You're doing tawaf, and there's women beside you here and there, and in front of you, you're, bu you're bumping into women. If this was such a big issue, why didn't Allah make it, you know, the hajj to be separate? This is an accusation that many people bring. Hajj is mixed. It's the biggest mixed gathering in the world. But why is it allowed? Obviously, you know, we can't compare. It's like comparing apples and oranges. I mean, at, a, at, at a hajj, there are unique circumstances, obviously. Had it been possible to separate it, maybe it would have been done. Had there been a possibility for that to happen, maybe it would have been there. But keep in mind at the same time that when people go for Hajj, they're not going there to check out the opposite gender, to looking to get married. I mean, most people who spend $10,000 to go to Hajj, you're not there looking to get married. You know, you're there to do your Hajj. There may be people, but generally speaking, Hajj is for those who are going for that spiritual excursion for that spiritual journey they're not there looking at the girls or the guys and, and even there the women are not dressed up the men we know it's haram for all of us when we go for hajj to even look in the mirror in ihram so your hair is a mess you can't shave it's haram to you know pull your hairs out that's haram you're not wearing good perfume that's haram you're not doing 25 things which are haram in the ihram and all or many of those things relate to your personal being of how you look, how you look presentable to other people. And so because there is no allure in the hajj, there's no dressing up in a nice suit, in a nice tuxedo, smelling good, combing your hair, none of that is there. The hajj is a unique experience. So we can't even say, well, hajj is mixed, so our majala should be mixed. Again, I've given you the examples where there are times that we can have these mixed gatherings, but obviously there are limits which our scholars have put on them. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We'll end there, inshallah, in our next session. I want to, again, address another topic next time that people bring up is that if we don't have mixed gatherings, how will our youth meet to get married? And it's a valid question. We all have to think about it. Because although there are you know, marriage websites and dating websites out there, Islamic marriage websites and matchmaking, and there are uncles and aunties out there who do all this matchmaking, but still youth have the question, well, how will I go and meet my spouse if we're behind you know, on this side and girls are over there? How will we meet one another? So hopefully next, in our next session, I want to make it more of a practical um, to give us some examples, and hopefully we'll also make that more interactive to get some feedback from the audience on how youth can actually meet for issues of marriage. Because if Allah says He's created spouses, they're out there somewhere, how do we meet them? It's not all online. It's not all through an app on your smartphone. Right? There has to be methodologies that we can, if we haven't implemented them already, to bring them into our communities, into our institutions, at a national, at an international level, to get our men and women met up together and so inshallah we will tackle that in our next discussion. We close and we ask Allah to keep us all on the path of Islam as taught by Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We ask Allah to forgive us any of our sins and shortcomings. We ask Allah to hasten in the return of our 12th Imam, Imam Al-Hujjah. And we ask Allah to give us all the ability to read, to reflect, to study and understand the religion of Islam to be able to implement what we learn of the religion and to ask Allah for guidance in those areas that we don't understand, that he helps us to understand it, the wisdom behind why certain actions are there within Islam. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiul alim. Let us close by remembering again the marhumin, the deceased who we saw on the screen, the names of the marhumin from all of the families who have lost loved ones. Let us also remember all of the marhumin from all of our communities, from all of our family, our friends, the ulama who have left this world, the shuhada, including the three young men who were brutally killed in Bahrain earlier this week, the three young men who were killed by firing squad for protesting in peaceful protests against the government.